מתפללת. אני יכול להסתכל על זה שעות, ואיך את שרה לעצמך ומתביישת, בא לי להיות האיש הזה שמנגן לך. תראי, הפכנו להיות יותר דומים, וגם אם לא תרגשי, תמיד אתן לך. בואי אליי, כמו הרוח לגליל, את יפה שאין מילים לדבר. בואי אליי, כמו השקט ללילות, את בכל התפילות שבלב. וכל השנים שעברנו, כמה בדרך אספנו, תראי, הפכנו לי. מות וניצחנו, כמה רחוק שהגענו, הפכנו להיות. Ladies and gentlemen, the program will begin shortly. You will be muted when the program begins. We'll be beginning in about two minutes. Thank you. את מכינה את השבת ומתפללת. אני יכול להסתכל על זה שעות, ואיך את שרה לעצמך ומתביישת. בא לי להיות האיש הזה שמנגן לך. תראי, הפכנו להיות יותר דומים, וגם אם לא תרגשי... תמיד אתן לך את כל החיים. בואי אליי, כמו הרוח לגליל, את יפה שאין מילים לדבר. בואי אליי, כמו השקט ללילות, את בכל התפילות שבלב. בכל השנים שעברנו, כמה בדרך אספנו, תראי, הפכנו להיות גדולים, היו מלחמות וניצחנו, כמה רחוק שהגענו, הפכנו להיות שלמים. The program will begin in just about one moment. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's program, No One Left Behind, integrating those with special needs into the IDF. I'm Mike Ross, president of Voice for Israel, And I am delighted that Voice for Israel has been able to partner with the Jewish National Fund to bring you this event. First, let me outline today's program. Samuel Richardson, the Director of Small Community Outreach for JNF, will present a short synopsis of the multitude of exciting and meaningful programs JNF undertakes to support Israel and the Jewish people. Then our guest speaker, Tehran Adia, will do a presentation on the Special and Uniform Program. Mark Werner will follow with comments about his participation with Volunteers for Israel and his interaction with the Special and Uniform Program, as well as other JNF initiatives. During the presentation, you will be muted, but you will be able to ask questions by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Turan will subsequently address your inquiries. And if we are unable to answer your questions, we'll attempt it in a follow-up email. Now I would like to introduce Sam Richards. who is truly responsible for bringing this event to fruition. He is a true Renaissance man who is particularly interested in the sociology of religion, family, Jewry, biblical history, theology, and Jewish continuity. 
He has a PhD in sociology at the University of Virginia. He has spent many years working in the Jewish philanthropic arena. Please welcome Samuel Richardson. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for that terrific introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to share with you today some of the things you may not know about the Jewish National Fund. First of all, we are more than trees. We have actually seven project domains, forestry and green innovations, education and advocacy, research and development, community building, heritage site preservation, disabilities and special needs, and water solutions. Now as JNF is more than just trees, we are also more than just cities. We operate throughout Israel, not just Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa. We provide a voice for many partners, lay leaders and staff who live and work beyond the large Jewish communities in our metropolitan areas in the United States as well. Although the phrase American Jewish community often brings to mind these places like Miami, New York, Los Angeles, there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish Americans who live in places like Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Grand Junction, Colorado, Eugene, Oregon, Evansville, Indiana. In fact, there are over 200 Jewish communities in the United States with fewer than 5,000 members. And most of them have been around for 135 years or more. Now, those of us who live in small Jewish communities do Judaism a bit differently than do our urban dwelling brothers and sisters. But our passion for Israel is just as deep. And we are proud to add our voice. I spent some, spent some time during my years in graduate school exploring the key differences between small Jewish communities and the large Jewish centers. In the aggregate, I call these differences thinking small, which is not small thinking. The key concepts of thinking small can be classified into four groups leveraged by parents and leaders in a community of virtually any size or tradition. Number one, don't rely on large institutions or the professional class. Number two, reduce outsourcing by increasing parental and personal responsibility. Number four, clarify and articulate community values. Three, number three, number four, is don't be afraid to set and clarify boundaries, which encourage living by community values. Now, the findings of my research indicate that when these principles are leveraged in a community, the strength of Jewish identity increases both at the individual and the community level. And there's a higher affinity with Israel. Children are more likely to return to their roots in their late 20s than are their peers in communities which do not employ these principles. And something many people do not realize is that as large as Jewish National Fund is, one of the secrets to our success is thinking small, meeting the needs of individuals, families, and communities. And so I'd like to briefly share with you two ways in which JNF meets the challenge and exceeds expectations. In our education and advocacy domain, the Jewish National Fund offers numerous ways to connect young American Jews to Israel and believes that in investing in education is critical to creating the next generation of Israel supporters. JNF prides its ability to provide, is, takes pride in its ability to uh, provide and nurture future generations in both the United States and in Israel. From B'nai Vispa projects to alternative spring breaks to birthright for college students and young professionals, JNF encourages, educates, helps students foster a greater connection and commitment to both the land and the people of Israel. Since 1972, the Alexander Most High School in Israel has been delivering outstanding academics with the most amazing adventures. It's fully accredited by the Middle States Association of Colleges and Schools and offers a robust curriculum, including Israel studies, general studies, experiential learning, college preparation, and Jewish life. And even better, the results can't argue with them. 65% participate in some sort of Jewish or Zionist organization compared to 18% of their peers. 80% donate to Jewish charities. 63% are members of a synagogue. And 88% of AMHSI alum marry a Jewish spouse compared to 56% of their peers. Wonderful, wonderful way to illustrate the impact of thinking small one student at a time and how that makes a world of difference. Caravan for Democracy 
is a student leadership mission to Israel, which provides non-Jewish students with the opportunity to explore the Jewish and democratic country of Israel through meetings with political, cultural, community leaders from diverse backgrounds and of different faiths. The goal of Caravan for Democracy is to facilitate constructive dialogue about Israel and the Middle East on college campuses across America. All we ask of Caravan participants is that they present their observations and facilitate a discussion about Israel in a public context on their campus during the spring semester immediately following their trip. We also have the Faculty Fellowship Program. It's a fully paid intensive program in Israel for full-time academics. Each participant is introduced to and paired with Israeli counterparts in their field of study. And this pairing is intended to facilitate academic exchange, collaboration, shared research, teaching, values, so that the participants bring what they have learned to their campuses when they return from the program. The trip includes extensive touring, visits to historical sites, as well as exposure to Israel's dynamic technological and scientific advancements. Participants hear from speakers of all sectors of Israeli society and join in debate in a variety of topics, academic, political, economic, and goes beyond the confines of conflict and demonstrates how Israel makes the world a better place. With all these terrific programs and experienced educators affiliated with the Jewish National Fund, just think of the K through 12 Israel education program we have available for your community. Please do check it out, jnf.org slash education. Macomb, it means place. Macomb community pioneers are made of young, creative, idealistic people from all sectors of Israeli society, creative, idealistic people from who are working, living, leading, socially innovating within their own communities throughout Israel. Macomb members create places where living is not just merely surviving, but thriving. JNF affiliate Macomb Pioneers designs educational programs and materials that make sense of how we can best be a free people in our land. Through deep explorations of freedom, peoplehood, security, and the land of Israel, their goal is to open up explorations into the possibilities that modern Jewish life affords. Utilizing Macomb's signature philosophy of hugging and wrestling with Israel and the Jewish people, expert teams offer a cutting edge approach that sparks and inspires Jewish hopes. Jewish National Fund has chosen Macomb as a partner on the ground in developing its Blueprint Negative and Go North initiatives. Through a variety of innovative culture, social programs in the fields of employment, culture, education, welfare, Macomb community pioneers are developing Israel's frontier and impacting the lives of over 500,000 individuals. With more than 200 small communities representing all sectors of Israeli society, young educators, Ethiopians, artists, mountain Jews, Druze, Haredi, other religious and secular pluralistic communities, these social startups are enhancing Israeli society. Their success is in groups moving together in order to work and support one another. And this is how they align themselves with Jewish National Fund's mission to bring 500,000 new residents to the Negev and 300,000 to the Galilee. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour of how thinking small can result in big wins for Israel, Jewish communities, families, and individuals. And so if small Jewish communities are important to you, please join our Facebook group at groups slash JNF small communities. Looking forward to seeing you there. And now it is my privilege to provide you with a brief video introducing today's featured program, Special in Uniform of the Israel Defense Forces. Thank you. 
יום שחור יותר טוב. הם אוכלים איתנו בחדרי אוכל, הם עובדים איתנו בעבודות, תורמים לכל דבר ועניין, בדיוק כמו כל חייל רגיל. ולאט לאט הם הופכים להיות חלק בלתי נפרד מהיחידה, וביחידה מחכים כל יום שהם יגיעו. אנחנו לוקחים את המחשבים ומפרקים אותם לחלקים. לראות פה זה הכי טוב שיכולתי לבקש. חלק מהפרויקט זה טירונות שעוברים שבוע ימים, וחלקם זה פעם ראשונה שיוצאים מהבית. עושים טירונות, מלמדים אותם על ערכי צה"ל, טיולים בארץ, הכרת הארץ, בעיקר שמירה על כבוד האדם. מסע כומתה, גדולים ומדים יוצא שהצלחנו. הפרויקט הזה הוא ברכה, הוא ממש מתנה בשביל הילדים האלה. סוף סוף עשיתי את זה! התרגשות גדולה שספיר הצליחה לעמוד במסלול הזה של שביל ישראל, שהיא תקבל היום כומתה. אני חיכיתי 22 שנה לרגע הזה, והנה הרגע הזה הגיע. Thank you, Sam. That was truly inspiring. Ah. Now it's my privilege to introduce Tehran Adia, a man who has devoted his life to serving Israel. He's a patriot who loves his country with all his heart. He's a decorated IDF major now in the reserves. Over the course of his 30-year career in the Israeli Defense Forces, Major Adia commanded a tank, the IDF's Technology and Logistics Forces Training Program, and the SARL Program for Army Volunteers from around the world. It is in that capacity that he forged his relationship and friendship with Mark Werner. Tehran is also a compassionate advocate for people with disabilities. He now serves as director of JNF's Special and Uniform Innovative Program that integrates young people with autism and other disabilities into the IDF and in turn into Israeli society. The program focuses on the ability, not the disability, of each person who takes part in the program so that they can become independent and integrated into Israeli society. Directly from Israel, Major Tehran Atiyah. Thank you so much. And, uh... I cannot tell you how excited I am for this Zoom meeting, especially today. I was uh, nominated to be part of the, um, the, head, the headquarter of the coronavirus uh, elimination squad in Israel. So I'm part of it and I hope that I will fulfill my mission. Wow. But anyhow, especially in uniform is a dear thing to me and this is my all, all my enthusiasm, power, strength go toward uh, everything that I'm doing today, especially in uniform. I'm going to take you back to 2006. In 2006, um, something very, very important in my life that changed my life from A to Z, upside down. In April, someone came to my office and said, Iran, I have a revolutionary idea to take people with special needs and induct them to the army. And I can tell you that back then, I was arrogant and I was some kind of thinking of myself of some kind of an almighty. 
And I told him, look, I know that you have a good intentions, but uh, this is not upon my agenda, so I'm not going to follow through with your dream. And people with special needs have no place in the army forces. And I don't know if you know, but uh, I'm going to tell you that in 2006, another major, major event happened in Israel, which was the war against the Hezbollah in Lebanon. And I was in 2006, the head of, uh, of the convoys that went up to the, um, to the soldiers. And I, have, I had almost 25 trucks in my convoy, but uh, probably the Hezbollah knew it the same way that I did or their intelligence. And, say, and when we got very close to Kiryat Shmona, the, the Lebanese border, uh, we started to have missiles from all over. And one of those missiles that hit the, the, the ammunition truck you know, in my mirror, I saw the explosion and I immediately went out, jumped for my leading car to help those soldiers that were wounded. And before I reached the ground, the surface, another explosion occurred and I found myself blasted to the ditches. And I was probably lost lost my conscience. I was in a very, very wet situation. I thought it was blood. But the only thing that I remember afterwards, it's me in a very, very white room. And I was totally, totally convinced that I'm in a guard induction center. There will be two, some kind of doors. One will be with angels, one will be with, with flames. And I hope that the one with the angel, with the angel will uh, open. But when I came to my senses, I found myself in Bet Cholim Ziv, up in Tzfat. Excuse me. And I started to get back my conscience. And you know, the first thing that you are doing after that kind of an event is to see that you are functioning which means that your hands, your legs, you can walk again, you can do the same things. But my brain gave the order to my legs and hands, but nothing moved. And I was paralyzed neck down. And when I found out that nothing is moving and I'm paralyzed, I decided that I don't want to continue with my life and I will do everything in my power and I didn't have a lot of power back then, but you know, to move my head from one side to another, those were the only thing that I, uh, that I could do. And I begged the nurses and the doctors to disattach me from all the machines that were attached to me. And they bought, I had uh, two sons back then and they uh, suggested that uh, maybe I will be incented to get my, uh, to regain my willing to live again by seeing them, so they bought them. And when I felt that I could not hug them or any, do anything with them, it just made my mind much more clear that there is no reason for me to live. But you know, mysterious the ways of God. You know, in Israel, during wartime, a lot of delegations, a lot of groups are coming to pay respect, to pay empathy for the wounded soldiers. And one of those groups that came, they were on uniform, but you can see that they are not real soldiers. All of them had some kind of disability. Some of them were on wheelchairs. Some of them were not looking a typical soldier. But one of them in particular caught my eyes and she looked at me very thoroughly and started to, uh, to approach my bed. And she had a Down syndrome. And you know, it's, it's a thing that you can really see by the face, the round face, the thick glasses. And when she came close to my bed, she asked me, can I pet your hand? Can I touch your hand? 
And when I looked at her, I said, what does she want for me in this particular time? And without me even answering, she took her both hands and gripped my left arm very, very strongly. I did not feel nothing, but I saw that her face is starting to wrinkle, which means that she is making a lot of efforts to help me. So she left the grip and I looked at my hand, it was very red from her finger. And she took a couple of steps back and uh, she said in Hebrew, everything is going to be all right. You know, in those kind of situations, you are even going to grip in anything that can help you. So I longed uh, for a miracle to happen. And unfortunately, nothing happened. So I was in my despair and uh, the she left and they left. And after a while, I cannot even express how long passed since. I started to feel twinkles in my toes, in my legs. And suddenly I felt electrical currents that goes through all over my body. And I didn't know how to connect it to what to connect it because it was some kind of a weird feeling that I felt. And I deliberately wanted to connect it to that lady. So after three months, I was back on my legs and back in my office and I learned very, very good or very, very tough lesson from this situation. First of all, you are a human being like anyone else. You are vulnerable like anyone else. And who gave you the authority to say no to those amazing people that the only thing that they want is to be part of. So at that point, I made the vow that I'm going to do everything in my power to support and promote people with special needs. And since I don't have any kind of education with special, with special needs, we tried a lot of various things to help them, but it was not really something that uh, helped them. So it was some kind of a nice to have program back then, and we didn't call it special in uniform. And I'm going to make fast forward to 2014. In 2014, I just discharged from the army and my friend called me and said, Tiran, let's initiate something that has no, nothing alike in Israel. Let's take people with special needs and really do something with them within the special, the, the IDF. And as for me, I said, look, I made a vow. As for me, just tell me, just give me the orders and I'm going to follow through with them. So in uh, July, the miracle really happened and we had no funds to, to run it. But you know, in Israel in 2014, we had another war, the Gaza war. And uh, only two planes came, one of the JNF and the other one is the Bloomberg. In the JNF, the Solidarity Mission came to see the Iron Dome. They came to see the tunnels. But at the same time that they were at the Home Front Command, they saw special in uniform. And at the end of the ceremony that you just saw in the clip, two nice ladies came to me and said, Tiran, we are from the JNF, and we offer you an, an opportunity to become an affiliate today. Back then, it was a partner. And um, I was not, I was skeptical about the support. But a week after, I'm getting a letter, a phone call from area code 212 which I didn't have any kind of friends back then in area code 212. At the other line was my angel and he said, Tiran, we decided that you are going to be part of, of uh, JNF. And I was totally, totally thinking that someone is fooling me. I looked for the candid camera and there was no candid camera. And at that phone call, history started, but history is yet to come. We started with 50 kids. And now I'm, I'm, I can say that I'm a proud father of 503, of this 503 
uh, kids that I have, three of them are my biological one, and 500 from specially uniformed soldiers from the program. So for the program, I give you a brief about the program as it is, and I cannot really think, there is not enough words to express my thank, thank, thank you to the JNF for fulfilling, it's not my dream, it's their dream to become a typical person, a typical human being by the support that we are getting from so many uh, US citizens, Israeli citizens, and from all over, just to promote and give those people, amazing people, a place in the Israeli society. So we performed a program, a three-phase program. The first phase is to analyze each one's ability. And when we find, we consider that each one of them as an unpolished diamond. We are trying to polish each <clears throat> angle of that diamond. And when it sparkles, we are starting to polish it again and again and again. Here we get to the, to the, to the, uh, to the um, situation that that guy is can, that guy or girl or boy can be independent and do, do something meaningful in the Israeli army. The second phase is the real army, which means that they are serving the army like anyone else, like anyone else. Two years for boys, for girls, and three years for the boys and they are getting all the benefits and getting everything like the typical soldiers, like the parachuter, <clears throat> like the pilot, and like the, those are supporting everyone. So, and the third phase, which we are facing, making some challenges for us, but we won't be afraid or intimidated by any kind of thing. So the first phase is the most crucial phase of that program, which we are facing now, is finding suitable jobs, essential jobs in the Israeli community, which means that that learning or that information or that skills, life skills that they acquired during their service, now it's the real time for them to go and see and practice, and we are escorting them to any place to find the suitable jobs for them. And from a guy that just absorb attention, <coughs> uh, resources from the family, from the government, from the state, suddenly he paid taxes. Think of the revolutionary idea of someone that always was absorbing things, suddenly he gives. So this is the revolutionary idea of special in uniform. Everyone has something to give. When we are finding this opportunity for them to give, this is our aim. So as I said, we started with 50, now we are 500 and our aim is to get to a thousand with the corona, without the corona, with the COVID, with the, without the COVID, we will get there. We have a five year plan that was approved by Professor Ellen Walk from uh, Emory University. And uh, we are being monitored. This program is being monitored and we are adjusting the, the program once in a while to see that we are in the right path. And fortunately for us, we are in the right path. And we see a huge, a huge progress in each one of our programs that we uh, Lior, the guy, the guy that you see in the, in the clip, that guy didn't have the opportunity to learn or write. But during the five months, we suddenly knew, find out with the, uh, with the software that that guy can write and read, but he probably has some block that blocked him from expressing his skills. And now that guy, Leo, is working, and you see he's a corporal. He was promoted from private to corporal, and he works with computers. So this is the transformation that we want to see in each one of our uh, participants.
So I was given 12 minutes. I think that I skipped one. Sam? Uh, no, let's go to the next slide. Let's hear more about the soldiers. Okay. So probably you ask yourself what each one of them are doing in the army. For example, Oded, which is, uh, was chosen to, to be the outstanding soldier, and I'm going to be with him, with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense in the 15th. We are going to get a certificate for Oded for outstanding performance. Oded, for example, is an expert of all the gardening tools, and he had, he had a, a course, a five, five week course, how to deal, how to take care, and how to use uh, gardening tools. Um, Linoy, that the, the nice lady that you see there in the picture also, she has, she has been paralyzed uh, at their left by, because of a virus. So she is paralyzed. Half uh, half of the half of the of her left body is paralyzed, and she overcame all the all the challenges due to to persistence and willing to be part of the Israeli society like anyone else. And we just gave her some uh, some opportunity to do uh, uh, to do. Uh, by her, and she she did it by her own. We just helped her at the, at the margin to see that uh, she is following through. You can skip to the next uh, picture. Okay, there. This oh, this is a great guy. He is on the spectrum, an expert in computers, and the only issue with him is that he is not communicating. So if you are starting to communicate with him, he block automatically. He's Canadian and they speaks fluent English and fluent Hebrew and also fluent Arabic. So uh, when we felt that he is keen about computers, we bought an expert from the Haifa University that deals with how to communicate with kids on the spectrum. And now he's uh, one of those who are writing software for missiles. So they found out that he's brilliant and we are so proud of him. And uh, by the way, we have to uh, wipe out his uh, face uh, so he won't be recognized. So this, this picture is not for publicized. You cannot publish it. Or the next one. Okay, this is, okay. I'm going to end with the guy at the left, the guy on the, the, guy on the, the op oppositing me. Uh, that guy was in Dubai last uh, last uh, Paralympic Olympic Games that were that were in Dubai, and they won the first prize, the gold medal. The first time that it was that the uh, Tikva was sang in front of all the Arab countries there, and now we are seeing the, the fruits of all the uh, the things that are being done with Dubai with the peace, peace process. So last year, the Tikva, due to special and uniformed soldiers, was sent uh, during the uh, gold medal award. So they are working in so various places. And as I said, we are trying to find the jewel or to spark in each one of them. And each one of them, we believe that has something to give. And when we find this special talent, I can tell you another one more anecdote about uh, um, Michal, which is freak about order. And if you see at her home, her cupboard is, uh, if you open, you see all the red shirts are folded in one place and all the white in one place. So she, <coughs> so she, she was, was taught how to how to deal with uh, catalog numbers within her uh, within the warehouse that she's working working in zero mistakes since she came she's so pedant she's so keen about order so none of the small parts or the, the big parts are lost due to uh, misunderstanding this is taking care of each one talent so uh, I think that we can uh, 
Continue. Thank you, Tarad. That was really a very compelling presentation, very moving. Um, now it is my privilege to introduce my very good friend, Mark Werner. Mark is a retired attorney who lives in Raleigh with his wonderful, really the force in the family, Arlene. He is a graduate of Haverford College and the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Before he retired, he served as Chief Legal Officer of GlaxoSmithKline. He has volunteered on Israeli military bases for each of the last 18 years with no plans to stop. He is the author of the most recent one, A Passion for Israel, Adventures of a Sarel Volunteer. He is currently the president of Volunteers for Israel, the organization that enables Americans to serve as civilian volunteers on Israeli military bases. And before I turn it over to Mark, I want to remind you again that you are all on mute, but you can put your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Now, Mark, welcome to our program. Thank you, Mike. Um, many of you know that I've just written a book, as Mike has said, about my experiences in volunteering on Israeli army bases through a program called Volunteers for Israel, or SARL. And I thank Sam for inviting me to, uh, to say a few words about, about that, um, about my book. Before I get to my comments about, um, about JNF, my book is called A Passion for Israel. It tells the story of a journey that led me to start volunteering on Israeli military bases. And it describes a unique volunteer opportunity available to everyone, anyone who'd like to volunteer to strengthen their connection to Israel. Volunteers for Israel places civilian volunteers to work on Israeli military bases. I went on my first volunteer stint in 2002 and I really liked it. So I went in the next year and I really loved it. I got hooked on volunteering. And so for each of the past 18 years, I volunteered on an Israeli military base. It's a wonderful experience because you feel like you're making a personal contribution to the state of Israel. Th this experience definitely takes you out of your comfort zone because you eat in the mess hall with the soldiers, you live in the barracks with the soldiers and you work side by side with them. And most importantly, you wear the uniform. You're not really in the Israeli army but you're required to wear the uniform to work on a base. And frankly, there's nothing more pride inducing than putting on that Israeli army uniform. The work we do is work which if we didn't do it, a soldier would have to do it. So we feel it's meaningful work. So what kind of work is it? It's routine work, base routine work. We repair communications equipment, we pack things, combat gear, uh, medical equipment, things like that. And the presence of the volunteers benefits Israel in two ways. First, by doing the work that we do, it frees up Israeli soldiers for more serious duties, such as guarding the borders of Israel or patrolling streets against terrorism. And secondly, our presence provides a tremendous morale boost to the Israeli soldiers. So I'd like to tell you a quick story from my book about how our presence benefits the Israeli uh, soldiers' morale. Um, in 2006, Tiran talked about the Second Lebanon War. In 2006, I was assigned to a paratrooper reservist base near Rehobo, and Tehran knows that base. And I arrived at the very end of the Second Lebanon War. So soldiers were coming off the fighting front from Lebanon back to this base to drop off their combat gear, to rest for a few days, and then go home. So it happened that on the very first night I was there, I ate dinner in the mess hall with a platoon of soldiers at my table who had just come out of three weeks of heavy fighting in Lebanon. And these soldiers were tired. They were more than tired. They were exhausted. You could tell by how they slumped over their food plates like this. They didn't talk to their neighbors. You can see in their eyes, they were very, very tired. So I happened to sit next to their, their sergeant, a young man named Danny, who was their best English speaker. And Danny engaged me in conversation. And at one point he asked me, pointing to me and the other volunteers in the mess hall, what are you doing on our base? And I replied, I explained that we were volunteers from around the world who'd come to support Israel by working on Israeli military bases. So he turned to his soldiers and translated that into Hebrew. And all of a sudden, these tired, exhausted, slumped over soldiers perked up and began speaking excitedly to each other in very fast Hebrew, which, of course, I don't understand. So I asked Danny, what are they saying? And he said, they're saying, hearing this is sweeter than breathing the air. Hearing this is sweeter than breathing the air. This is the impact we had in boosting the morale of the Israeli soldiers. So to summarize, my book is called A Passion for Israel, Adventures of a Sorrow Volunteer, 
It's available on Amazon. It describes a very rewarding opportunity for Americans to show their support for Israel in a very personal way. Now, you may be wondering why JNF, why Sam asked me to come and speak with you today. Is there a connection between my book and JNF? And the answer is absolutely yes. I'll explain why. In growing up, I had always associated JNF with planting trees in Israel. Every home I knew had a little blue JNF box, like the ones you see on the screen, for donations that went toward helping JNF plant trees in Israel. But as I grew up, I got to learn that JNF does a lot more than just plant trees. When my daughter was a junior in high school, she spent a semester at the Alexander Muss High School in Israel. It's a wonderful program, which solidified her connection to Israel. I learned later that JNF sponsors this unique school for American, American Jews, and it's a wonderful school. Then I started volunteering. I learned about more things that JNF does in Israel. One day, I went on a tour of Sderot, the town on the Israeli border with Gaza, which is constantly being rocketed from, from Gaza. I learned that the rockets had hit outdoor playgrounds, killing Israeli children. I also learned that JNF had come up with a solution, which allows the children of Sderot to play in a safe environment. JNF funded the construction of the largest indoor bomb-proof playground in the world in Sderot. It can hold up to 550 children at a time. It's a wonderful thing for the children of Sterot. And I was so impressed with this project that I wrote about it in my book. Then on another occasion, I learned from a friend about an amazing environmental project that JNF had funded in Israel. It turns out that Israel sits astride a geological fault in the earth called the Syrian African Rift. This fault stretches from Turkey and Asia Minor all the way down to the Zambezi River in Africa. Every year, 500 million birds make an annual migration up and down this fault, flying south for the winter and north for the summer. There's one problem with this vast migration of birds. The birds stop in Israel to eat and to rest. They tend to stop in central Israel, where many kibbutzim make an, a living by operating fish farms. The problem is the birds eat up all the farmers' fish, ruining their farms. The farmers were forbidden by Israeli law to harm the birds, so they tried everything they could think of to scare them off barking dogs, loud noises, but nothing seemed to work. Then the farmers partnered with JNF to come up with a novel solution. JNF built a line of reservoirs along the birds' migratory path and stocked them daily with fish. Gradually, the birds learned to land on these reservoirs to eat instead of in the farmers' fish farms. This solution saved the farmers' livelihood and also provided a reliable source of food for the migrating birds. I've been to one of these reservoirs. They are amazing places because the flocks of birds using them are so great that when they fly up in the air, at times they almost block out the sun. There's so many of them. Now, I was so impressed with this JNF project that I also wrote about it in my book. But the most impressive JNF project I experienced was a special and uniform program. One year, I volunteered on a base near Afula, Israel, where two special and uniform soldiers were stationed. These two soldiers had down syndrome. They worked in the base kitchen along with about a dozen other soldiers. The soldiers in the kitchen treated these two special uniform soldiers as part of their team, acting as an older brother or sister when they needed a bit of emotional support, which at times they did need. Now for these two special uniform youngsters, you could see how proud they were to be in uniform and contributing to the IDF. For example, their jobs in the kitchen were in a hot, sweaty environment. The kitchen soldiers were allowed to take off their army shirts and wear only t-shirts for that reason. They all did that, except for these two special youngsters. They were so proud of being in uniform that they would never take their army shirts off, no matter how hot and how sweaty it was. Wearing that uniform was so important to them. Another example was morning flag raising. Every morning, the soldiers on the base, along with the volunteers, would line up in front of the flagpole for a minute or two just before flag raising, but not these two special uniform youngsters. They would be lined up every morning at least 15 minutes ahead of time. Flag raising was that important a part of their lives because it meant that they were part of the IDF and they wanted to make sure they didn't miss it. At every flag raising, a soldier is honored to be chosen to raise the flag and then salute it. On our last day on the base, they called out the name of one of the special and uniformed soldiers to raise the flag. As she scampered up to the flagpole to accept this honor, she had a, a smile on her face that was a mile wide. And all of us, soldiers and volunteers alike, celebrated too, seeing how meaningful this was to her. I was so impressed with what I saw that I devoted several pages in my book just to the Special and Uniform Program. It allows youngsters with special needs to be a part of the IDF and to be proud that they're able to contribute to the defense of their country. It's a great program, 
and I commend JNF for funding it. So in summary, I've seen through many, my many experiences in Israel that JNF does a lot more than just plant trees, and that makes JNF a much more valuable contributor towards strengthening Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I have your book. It's a great book and I recommend it to everybody if they want to learn more about Sorel and a lot about uh, Israel culture and, and, and what's going on there. Um, turn it back to Tehran to address some of the questions that have come in. And I want to remind folks, if you'd like to uh, uh, put a question in the chat box for Tehran as well and for Mark as well. Tehran, do you have any questions uh, that have come in? I hope Tehran isn't frozen. Um, hmm. He hmm. might, his internet might be for that would, that would be unfortunate. Um, one of the questions that I think we can answer with those here, and hopefully we'll get to run back on, uh, is that the United States is modeling after the Israel Special in Uniform. And what is the current status of that? I'd be happy to take that if nobody else would like to. <laughs> Um, yeah, it is true that the President's Special Task Force on Disabilities has spent time with Special in Uniform in, in Israel and here in the United States, and there is legislation pending to bring a Special in Uniform type program to the United States Army. Um, it's, it's scheduled to start soon, as soon as funding has been approved, and it's a very fa fabulous way that Israel is, is truly being a light to the nations, including our own. And you can find out more specific information about that on the podcast at Israelcast, jnf.org slash Israelcast, where the uh, American representative of uh, the president's task force, well, yeah, he's obviously American. Uh, the, the, he's the president of the presidential task force on, on disabilities. He, is, he reports that on that podcast. So um, please take a look at that. Um, still waiting for Tehran. Um, another question is um, from, from Shari Shokler. Would an Ole Hadash, a new immigrant with limited Hebrew, be eligible? Anybody? Um, Comment on that. Oh, Tehran is back. Here. Great, oh, Tehran. I was just, everything was frozen and suddenly. Ah. So, Ken uh, Ole I just heard about uh, the, the, the former sentences that you talked about, the light of the nation. So, we brought special uniform to the US. We started already two groups, one in uh, uh, West Virginia and one in South Carolina. They are started at the marshal offices, and I was supposed to be in, in April, last April, at the uh, at, to meet the admiral in San Diego, but unfortunately, as you know, the COVID-19 is uh, has another plans for me. But uh, still, we are going to make, especially in uniform USA, flourish as the two groups that uh, that are there. And without getting into politics, the Trump administration nominated uh, a guy by the name of Chris Steele to be the head of inclusion committee in the US. That guy uh, was here in Israel and he met, especially in uniform with uh, David Friedman, the US ambassador to Israel. And they were so impressed and they said that this is do not deal with any kind of red or blue or uh, donkey or elephant or whatsoever. This is talking about human beings that want to be like the others. And I am fully aware of what can be done with people with special need 
and we gave away free with no charges whatsoever all of our knowledge, information, consulting, everything in our power to help the others. And uh, we started with two groups. The plan for this year was to get to almost 10, but it will be the following years. I'm not giving up. Uh, so we just froze the, uh, <coughs> the program in the US as for now. But I know that Chris nearly met the president and uh, he has now some budget to follow through with this uh, program. And uh, there would be no, I would be the happiest person ever to see that something that happened here very locally suddenly spread all over in the 52 states of the United States. And we are talking about people with special needs that they want to be like all the others. John, we have a Colombia, question. We have a question from Judy Josephson. Is there a plan to move the special and uniform graduates into an employment situation after their service? Absolutely. This is the third phase that I talked about. The whole idea of special in uniform is to see them mainstreamed at the Israeli society. The army is not the hardcore of the program. The hardcore of the program is to see them after the age of 21 or 22 when they graduate the army, to see that they are mainstream uh, in the Israeli companies, in the Israeli uh, uh, market, labor market, to see that they are earning salary, bringing money to their family, and doing the same like all the others. This is the main core of special in uniform. It starts with the army because the army is some kind of a background for all of us. But more than that, the idea that the army gives set of skills that you cannot get in, in foster homes or in uh, uh, hostels or group homes or ever, because the disciplines that they are being acquired, uh, required to be in special in uniform within the army are like the older typical soldiers, which they had so many discounts during their set, during their life. We in the army say, if you are a soldier, you are a soldier. If you don't want to be a soldier, so you are not part of special in uniform. But we are not saying no to no one because we know to stream each one of them and maneuver each one of them to reach his peak, to reach his limit. And when you see that he reached it, then we are starting a new way <clears throat> of breaking the glass and seal of theirs. So the mainstream is to to, to bring them to a phase that they can work and salary like anyone else. Thank you. And from Sherry Shuckler again, would an Ole Hadash with limited Hebrew be eligible? And if so, what are the age limits? It depends on the age. We are usually starting with our, our uh, soldiers at the age of 16. The army accepts people with special needs till the, let's say, 22, 23. And even we started to see 26, even. But uh, the age limit is approximately 25. And uh, as for Lechadash, there is no limit because most of our uh, uh, instructors or mentors are uh, English speaking. So this is part of the thing that we want them to teach, especially in uniform soldiers. And they are being taught English in a scale that they can uh, understand it. But still, this is one of the things. So the, the language is not a barrier unless it doesn't know any kind of Hebrew. And the idea is to communicate with his friends, not with the instructors. So he has to have some Hebrew um, skills to use as a start. Thank you. And for a, a, a kind of wrap up question, let's invite Marsha Harris from Voice for Israel. Duran, thank you for bringing us information about this amazing program. It sounds so fantastic. I imagine it's quite expensive. Can you tell us about how much the cost is for each participant in the special and uniform program? Okay, we are getting to that part. Um, to host, let, let's say that they are not costing nothing, which means that we invest. We invest in them and we invest in the Israeli society and the Israeli community. 
And when I say invest, the, the, if we are taking them to a group home without doing nothing with them, it's approximately between 40 to $50,000 a year. So special in uniform is breaking this equation that say one year is 50,000 for each person. And we, by making a group, making, we call it a unit. A unit in special in uniform, it's a 10 participant. Each participant is approximately uh, $10,000 per year, which means that he's getting uh, all the logistics, lodging, uh, everything beside medication. And also the most important thing that they are getting is we are analyzing each one's ability. And when I talk about analyzing each one's ability, we are working with social workers, psychologists, and instructors to see what can they do. And this takes uh, a large chunk of those 10,000. So each one of them, we invest in each one of them $10,000. And in this $10,000 per year, usually uh, our donors are as a consistent donor because we don't want um, no one to get after that last year, after the, the year ended, so there is no continuity. So usually we are getting some that are uh, doing some kind of uh, adopting a soldier. So $10,000 per year and for uh, a group, of 10 or a unit, it's a, it's a hundred thousand per year. And this is the main, uh, th those are the main costs of special unit for social. I want to thank Taran and Mark for participating in this very moving presentation, as well as Sam and the entire JNF team for bringing this event to our audience. I cannot sufficiently express my genuine admiration and gratitude for all the tremendous work JNF does, and particularly its inspiring program, Special in Uniform. It is a program which reminds us that we are all made in the image of God and that everyone deserves the opportunity to reach their full potential. You will very soon be receiving an email which will provide links on how you can donate to JNF so that it may continue all of its exemplary work about which we have heard so much today. Truly, JNF is so much more than just planting trees. To learn more about us and to stay in touch with JNF Voice for Israel, or Volunteers for Israel, you should now see on your screen the contact information for, your, for our websites and Facebook pages. Tomorrow, you will also receive an email with this contact information. A recording of today's program will be posted on the JNF Facebook. Again, thank you for attending today's event. And on behalf of all of us in the JNF Voice for Israel, and Volunteers for Israel families to a warm, sweet, and happy new year. L'Shana Tov. Shana Tov. Shana Tov. Shana Tov, everybody. Shana Tov, everybody. Thank you. Shana Tov. Bye-bye. See you soon in Israel. Thanks. <laughs>